Okay, awesome. So I'm going to turn it over to Steve McCauley. Um, Steve has served as the FCA Area Director for Upper East Tennessee since 2004. He serves as a chaplain, pastor, coach, mentor, and encourager at every opportunity. He's been married to Wendy since 1987, has three kids, Andrew, Rachel, and Daniel, who is the current EHS football manager. He's here. He's, he's here. He's in person. Awesome. Yeah. Steve grew up in the Tampa Bay area of Florida, where he worked in family furniture beginning at age 13. He loves sports, especially football, baseball, water skiing, and scuba diving. Mm -hmm. The Macaulay family relocated to Elizabethan to work at Joe River Forge in 2001, was called to join the Fellowship of Christian Athletes staff in fall of 2004. He currently serves coaches and athletes through FCA on college, high school, middle school, and youth levels, and is the chaplain for the Johnson City Cardinals for the past 10 years. Thank you, Steve. All right. Now the Doughboys is what they're called. Oh, that's right. Pillsbury Doughboys. That's right. We've got a whole at Greenville Middle School. Yes. You know, Larry Bible, right? Yes, yeah, I'm Coach Bible. He works with yes. me. So it's a good name, huh? Coach Bible. <laughs> well, I've got a – is my PowerPoint ready? I can't. Can't pull it up? I can't share it. Uh, I, I want to tell you a story. I, I'm going to try and make my – talk a little abbreviated you might I might get an amen for that but if you can pull the PowerPoint up if not follow along in your schedule there I've got the thank you Jillian put the slides in there and um, I want to start off by you'll notice Tony Dungy the top picture on the top left coach Tony Dungy was one of my mentors growing up and I mentioned that I grew up in, in Tampa Bay and he was the uh, Buccaneers head coach right for the last few years couple of years before I moved to East Tennessee in the late 90s around 2000 and he got fired right but <laughs> and then um, coach Gruden took that team and I think it was 02 to the Super Bowl but in my heart it was Tony Dungy's team that Gruden took to the Super Bowl now that's not taking anything away from Gruden Chucky right but coach Dungy went on to Indianapolis and built that program up and actually got his super his well-deserved to me, second Super Bowl win, right, in my heart. And I just respect the man so much because you would see him in that top picture. He's just standing on the sidelines like this, right? He's not reacting out of his almond, right? He's reacting out of his watermelon. And, and as a Christian coach, I'm a fellowship of Christian athletes advocate, he's reacting out of the peace that passes understanding that the Bible talks about. And we, don't, and we get that from our creator. Well, Tony Dungy, I got a chance to... Uh, hear him speak. I had a chance to go and meet Tony Dungy in person at an FCA conference banquet in Chattanooga uh, about probably a year or two after I started. So about oh, well, five, oh, six. And uh, he was the keynote speaker. And I, I'll never forget, he, he got up and he talked a little bit about his playing days, but two things that stood out of what he talked about that day. One was he said when he played for Pittsburgh, he was an awesome player for Pittsburgh back in the day, right? Well, he played for Chuck Knoll, Coach Chuck Knoll, and Coach Knoll used to tell the guys, just like I'm looking at you guys, guys, football is not who you are. Baseball, whatever the sport is, it's not who you are, Coach. It's what you do. Who you are is far more than, than the game, Right? And that's what the last session was about. It was about identifying. These kids aren't identified by their problems, right? We're not identified by our problems or our successes, our failures or our success. If we identify by our failures or our successes too much, we're not putting our worth in our true identity. So I wanted to share some of these um, pictures with you of, uh, let's see, I think this is, is that thing on? The, the advance? It's not. If you can advance the slides for me, that's fine. The next slide, what do you, how, how would you, how do you think this guy feels with a name like that, right? And then they show the miscues, the bad stats under him, right? Next slide. You can just rip through these. How about a name like that? Now, if these guys were identified by their name, right? Names tell us something, but they don't tell us about who that person is, right? Give us another one. How about this guy? He was destined to be a firefighter, right? <laughs> next one <laughs> now i hadn't followed him in a while right since i was a kid but apparently he's been up to no good lately and then everybody likes this guy he's everybody's <laughs> friend he's the life of the party right all right and then this doctor i don't know if he's an allergist or a urologist i can't figure that out but 
His name is P at you. Uh, okay, and then uh, I did not know that Batman had been Superman, but apparently, and he's from Javan, he's Javanese, okay? And uh, this guy was destined to get really bad marks there. He got a 5.3 and a 5.5. Look at his name. Uh, <laughs> next one. <laughs> and then, now, this is England because they, they spell center with an R-E at the end. And I bet this is the only Christian guy in England. I'm not sure about that, but he may be. And then the next one, uh, this guy was destined to be the, the meat manager with a name like that. And finally, not finally, but this guy, it's a good thing that he got exonerated with a name like that because he would be the first one that they would suspect when money is missing. Next one. Uh, are you, it's hard to see that, but his name is Obi-Wan Kenobi. So definitely a Star Wars fan. I did not know he was from California. And <laughs> this, this is Lord Voldemort uh, with a T, a R, Lord Voldemort R. <laughs> Next. And this is my favorite doctor name. And this is a true name. I looked it up. I researched it. And we're not going to even talk about what kind of doctor he is. And then everybody's favorite, Jed. I night. Well, <laughs> you can see funny names are funny, but they don't tell you who you are. And Tony Dungy got up. You can go to the next slide that night at that banquet. And he told, I thought he would tell about his glory days of playing, right? And he hadn't won a Super Bowl yet. Remember, he had already left Tampa Bay and he was at Indianapolis, but he was building that program. And he got up and I thought he was going to talk about how hard he was working and how it was you know, it was his team that won the Super Bowl in Tampa. He didn't do any of that. He was so gracious. He got up and he told us the story. 2,500 people told us the story of the three little pigs. This great, great giant of a coach to me, my men, one of my mentors, he tells the story of the three little pigs. And we all know the story, don't we, coach? I mean, we, we may not have heard it in a long time, but all of us have heard that nursery rhyme or whatever you call it, that nursery story, that kid's story and the first pig built he went over the whole thing he said the first pig built his house out of what straw right straw or hay and he even made the point do you know how hard it is to build a house out of straw you got to work really hard at that right and he was building a point that i'd never thought of the way he was expressing it i had never thought of it before and he said the next one was sticks right he built his house out of sticks and the big bad wolf came along and he said, I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. And he did. And those houses didn't stand. And he said, they finally went to the brick house, the pig that built his house out of bricks. And they all got safely in there. And the big bad wolf said, I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. And he puffed and puffed and blew and, up, and the house didn't fall down, right? And then Tony Dungy stepped back and he said, we often criticize those first two pigs for being stupid, lazy, not as smart as the third one. He said, they all work just as hard. He said, you could argue they worked harder. The first ones worked harder because it's a lot harder to build something out of straw and sticks than it is bricks. Bricks just stack them up with mortar, right? He said, they just, they work just as hard, but they just used the wrong building material. That was it. They both built their, they all build houses, right? And he equated it to building your life. He said, your kids, your players, all of us, are building our lives with some material. And he said, what material are you using? We just heard a great session about these kids that are coming from traumatized backgrounds. What are they building their life with? Some of them are doing the best they can with straw. They don't know what else to do. They're just putting their, you know, with straw. And he said, we need to give bricks. It was the best, it was a fundraising banquet, the best one they ever had. He said, we need to give these kids bricks. And FCA is the organization that God has aligned me with. That's what Tony Dungy said. He's a Christian coach. He said, he quoted Billy Graham, said the greatest thing about coaches, and I want to encourage you coaches with that and those online. He said, a coach will influence more people in one year than the rest of us will in a lifetime. The average person out there, even teachers, right? Coaches just, there's something about coach said, coach said. So I want to just encourage you with that. And then the next slide is a picture of a perfect um, song lyric that's based on a story that Jesus told a couple of times. And we've probably heard the song, the wise man builds his house upon the rock, right? That little Sunday school song. 
and the foolish man builds his house upon the sand, right? There's two extremes that are presented there. Well, what are you going to build your life on? If you've, if you've grown up with sand, you got to find a rock. Well, we point at FCA, we point them to Christ. Christ is the rock. That's, that's our worldview. We believe that's the foundation, but you got to have a good foundation. So we, the next slide shows you what your life looks like. Your life is like this high story building. Now, the most important aspect of this building is the foundation, right? It's not the top floor. I'm living in, and if you think of it as your life, of each floor as a year of your life, I'm living in a 56 story building, about to be a 57 story building, right? I don't know if that's, if it's going to go up to 65 or 75 or 90 or 100. I don't know how many stories I'm going to have. But you know what? If I don't have a good foundation, how hard is it going to be to build the next floor? The next floor. And if you're on sand, you, you get to a, a, a 15, 16, 18, 20 story building and you start, you know, right? Because you're, you're looking at things other than the solid rock to build on. And I want to tell you about a, a, a 19, 20 year old in the Bible. Next slide. His name was Solomon. And God came to him in a dream. He was going to be the next king of Israel. This is 3,000 years ago. And he said, I'll give you whatever you want. This is like the genie. Everybody dreams of that, you know, the genie giving you, you find the bottle and you rub it and you get three wishes. Well, this was one wish from God. He's better than the genie. He said, you name it, I'll give it to you. And Solomon said, I want wisdom. And God said, good answer. And God said, because you answered wisdom, I'm going to give you fame and fortune to go along with it. So Solomon was the wisest, richest king, man who ever lived. I've heard it said that if you compared his with his riches to like Jeff Bezos or you know Bill Gates or any of those guys, it would it would be ten times what the richest man in the world today has, okay? because the Bible talks about how many talents of gold he got every year and all this kind of stuff. But the riches didn't matter; he had the wisdom, right? You can have all the money in the world <laughs> and have no wisdom and be a fool and 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 go to a lost eternity. But if you have wisdom, the rest the rest will come. A great verse to build your life on is this, this one here. If any of you lacks wisdom, I'll, I'll be the first one to raise my hand. This is a promise in God's word. If any of you lacks wisdom, it says, ask God and he'll, he'll, he'll freely give it to you. He's the God of all wisdom and he will give it to you, James 1. And then the next slide is one that I heard growing up from my grandfather when I was just a little kid. My grandfather would often tell me this verse, train up a child in the way he should go, and when, he, when you're old, you won't depart from it. And, and oftentimes with wayward children, they will go wayward, but if they've got that foundation, that, that solid foundation, they'll come back to that. And that's what many, many parents that have wayward children, and you're going to have wayward children in your program that are, that are looking, they're floundering like those rats in the water. They're floundering for the ramp. You got to point them to the ramp, the way they should go. Next one. And, and the Bible says this is one of the best highlights in the Bible right there. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding because a lot of times that'll go into the almond, <laughs> right? Even if you lean on the watermelon, if it's not tied to the creator, the one who created it, and again, this is a Christian worldview. I'm not going to force it on anybody, but it's there. If anybody wants more information, uh, my contact info is there, but if you acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. We need straight paths. We need straight paths and, and uh, we need a light at the end of the tunnel in a dark world. And then I want to finish by telling you a story about Gary Quazzo. He's on the right there. Beautiful teeth, doesn't he? Look at that. Gary Quazzo was a quarterback for 10 years in the NFL in the 60s and 70s. He became a dentist. That's why I say something about his teeth. He's a friend of mine. He's a personal friend of mine. Uh, Gary Quazzo is a retired dentist, orthodontist. He lives in Florida, but he played in the NFL for 10 years. And he's not a big name, but he played with Joe Namath and all those guys back in the 60s and 70s. Gary Quazzo, his life, he had everything you can imagine. Great 10-year career, beautiful 10-year career in the NFL, a beautiful wife, beautiful children. He had a son named Gary Quazzo Jr. that would be almost my age now. And Gary Quazzo Jr., go to the next slide. This is him. That's Gary Quasso Jr. He 
was a stud athlete in high school. Uh, he broke all kinds of records. He got college offers, but he made one error in his senior year when he went to the prom. He went with a group of kids that, that said, let's take some drugs tonight. Let's party like it's 1999, even though it was 1989 or 1990, 1989. Uh, and they took drugs and it put him on a trajectory that his mom and dad didn't even know he was on. It was actually in 85, because that's the year he graduated high school. Went off to college and he played, he held it all together. He played quarterback. He was a stud quarterback, great athlete, but he was struggling. He had one foot in the drug world and he had one foot in football. And you can do that for a little while, right? But you can't do that for four years. He did it for one year, he faked everybody out. He did it for one year and then he got kicked off the team. He just, he just couldn't handle it. So he, he went to JUCO and floundered, got more involved in drugs, downward spiral, guys, downward spiral. They got a call. It was in July of 1990. They got a call from the Miami Police Department. Hello? Yeah, Mr. Quazzo, Dr. Quazzo, we uh, have found a body uh, dumped on the side of the road in Miami here, and we believe it's your son to come down and identify the body. Dr. Quazzo said that was the worst night of his life you can imagine. Couldn't sleep, kept crying out to the Lord saying, because they're a Christian family. Lord, why did, Lord, if there's some, like they couldn't get a hold of their son. So they figured it was probably him. And they had to go identify the body. A drug deal had gone bad that night before. And Gary Quazzo Jr., they called him Chip because he was a chip off the old block. He got shot ex execution style in the head twice and dumped. They found, the, they found the killers. But Gary, Dr. Gary Sr. and his wife were just heartbroken. You can imagine. They went home in silence. And what was going through Dr. Gary's mind was, Lord, I hope that this isn't his death. It is 20, he died at 22 years old sold in this tragic way. I hope it's not in vain. I hope that you can make some good come out of it. Lord, we trust you to do that. And a couple days later, they were cleaning out his apartment. You can go to the next one, and they found these letters that were written. Chip never talked to his dad much. They just thought his life was great. They said he's a great quarterback. He's, he's, he's doing great, and his life was spiraling out of control, but he didn't know how to tell anybody. He didn't know how to reach out for help. And this is what I want to tell you. It ties in with the last session. Your kids are hurting with something. This guy had it all. This guy had the looks, the talent, everything, the money. He was from a wealthy family, but inside he had turmoil. He had, he had anxiety. He had depression. He didn't know how to ask up for help with it. And, he, and they found these letters, and in these letters, you can read through it's three slides. I'm not going to read the letters to you, but some of this highlight, it says, I, I, I love you, Dad. Please forgive me for, you know, my, he was saying how, how much he would get drunk and, and use drugs and stuff. And his dad said, that's a gate, that's a gateway that is only going to lead to, it's going to lead to either three things, jail, uh, rehab, or death, right? That's, there's no good outcome from it. And yeah, it'll numb the pain for a little while, but it will only lead to, to a downward spiral. But what good came out of it was Gary Quazzo Sr. went out on a speaking tour. He was on the board of uh, directors for FCA in the 90s. And he they formulated this thing called uh, One Way to Play. You can go on through. That's just one more. One Way to Play Drug Free. And he went out all over the country. The dad, the NFL guy who lost his son, he would go tell this story that I just told you in his own words, how this heartbreaking story about their family, but the good came out of it because he would get in front of audiences with this program. And that's why this talk is entitled One Way to Play. Guys, there's only one way to play with play life. Forget sports, play in life, but it includes sports, is drug-free. And it goes way beyond just say no. That was a big campaign in the 90s that the government tried to do. Well, you can't say no to peer pressure. You can't, you can't just say no. You need a higher power to just say no. And, I, and we believe as the FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, that that higher power is the, the Lord Jesus Christ, God, to come and help you 
make those decisions. But Gary Quazzo Sr. got to go around, tell this heartbreaking story to thousands of young people in, in high schools and middle schools. And that one way to play drug-free campaign was launched in the 90s and it became a huge success, way better than the government could do it. And, and, and I don't mean any disrespect by that, but usually private sector does it better, right? Than the government will. And there were kids coming, making decisions, making commitments. Yes, I, at the end of that, I'll play, I will make a commitment to play my high school career, my college career drug free. And you know, if that pattern keeps going, all, that'll become a way of life. I've heard Coach Torbush at ETSU used to say, he said, say guys, if you do something for 30, 30 times, it becomes a habit. He's, he's right. If you, if you smoke a cigarette 30 days in a row, it's going to be a habit. If you drink a beer 30 days in a row, it's going to be a habit. If you read your Bible 30 days in a row, it's going to become a habit. And whatever we do repeatedly becomes a habit. So we need to choose good things, that solid rock foundation. But some good came out of it so that we can stand up here today at conferences like these and tell you the pain of someone's, someone's story is paying it forward to help someone else in life. If this helps one kid not take drugs at a prom, and, that, and Gary Quazzo Sr. heard so many kids would come up, like you told me where you went to high school and what year you graduated. In their mind, they'd already talked to their friends. It'd be two weeks from prom, man, we're going to party, man. We're gonna, I, got, I, you know, I know what we're going to get. And those kids would come up to him with tears saying, we, we planned on doing that, but I'm not going to do it now. I'm going to make this commitment that you're talking about, Mr. Quazzo, because it's more important. It's, a, it's, a, it's setting a goal, a trajectory of my life that's not going to take me on a downward spiral, but an upward spiral toward good things and good outcomes. So thank you, guys. That's my, my uh, program, One Way to Play, Drug Free. It is the way to go. It's the only way to go. One way. God bless you guys. That was good timing. Right. Oh, on me. Oh, on me. Yeah, yeah, Let's Okay, I'm gonna ask our next speaker to come on up here. I'll just grab this one. Thank you. I yep. also am going to put the link to our um, just a little survey about today in the chat box for you all who are on Zoom. If you will please fill that out um, and let us know what we can do better next time or anything you learned or particularly enjoyed. All right. And you ready? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Todd Newberry is the head football coach at Greenville Middle School. He grew up in Grundy, Virginia, went to college and played football at Carson Newman. He's been teaching and coaching for 29 years. Yeah. <laughs> he coached football at Council High School in Virginia, Greenville High School, and Greenville Middle School. Newberry is a respected coach, mentor, and leader in his community. Well, that is so kind, so kind. Who wrote that? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> not me, not me. Um, uh, cool thing about my life is I've been around football for 50 years. My father was the head football coach. Matter of fact, around here, uh, Coach Ryder's a big deal. Dave Ryder's a big deal. The Dave Ryder I know used to wear green oh. in Tazewell, Virginia. <laughs> So a lot of people forget that Coach Ryder, uh, growing up in Southwest Virginia, uh, my father was a Grundy. So uh, I got to know a lot of people, a lot of coaches through that area. If you want to, we can skip on. We can hurry this up. I can't. Yeah. What's it doing? I'm trying to share it, but that's the only thing. Uh, this. Uh, this while they're working on the problem what i planned on doing was having a big uh a big thing talking about offensive formations that i started with and defensive formations and then what my philosophy was but we can just skip all that uh we can make this quick um uh, you know what what i've learned in the 29 years is uh you've got to know oh, whoa skip one Got the, the hard story. I wasn't a real good coach when I first started. It's funny. Coaching the game and playing the game is two different things. You know, been a coach's son, uh, played uh, 
college football, uh, great coaches at Carson Newman. I snuck in on coaches meetings. They'd throw me out. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to learn all I could. Well, I thought that I knew it all. When I went to council, uh, they had not had a football team. So I had to learn budget, you know, stuff they don't teach you in college. You know, I had to learn practice schedules. Uh, we didn't have a home field, so we played 10 games away. We went everywhere in southwest Virginia we could. Didn't win a game. Luckily, uh, the next year, Fred Sorrells uh, hired me at Greenville. Coach with Coach and my father played together at Carson Newman. All right? <laughs> so I've known Coach literally all my life. Uh, but when I was young, I did a lot of yelling. I thought that's what you did. You know, I thought coaching was yelling. Um, you know, uh, the kids didn't like me very good. For that matter, the coaches didn't like me very good. Uh, and I didn't know why. And, uh, you know, uh, I was kind of cocky like most young kids are. You know, I thought I played high school football. I played college football. I knew how, what football was about. Well, I didn't know what football was about. Uh, and Coach Sorrells had this talk with me. Uh, Coach Sorrells and my dad, like I said, played football together. So dad told Coach, if I needed spanking, spank me. Well, luckily, this time he didn't spank me. He had, but he didn't that time. So, but when he sat down, he said, for you to be a good football coach, you got to know your players. He said, you don't treat them the same. He said, you treat them fair. You don't treat them the same. And he said, you, I'm going to tell you when you know you're a good football coach. He said, 20 years down the road, when you see those kids at Walmart, he said, and they're with their family, he said, either they're going to come to you, hug you, introduce you to the family, thank you for what you've done, or they're going to see you and turn away. And uh, that meant a lot. You know, to a 22-year-old, you don't think about any of that. But, uh, you know, that was huge. Um, and, you know, and then I said, you know, it turns out uh, I didn't know coaching football at all. You know, the X's and O's, uh, there was a lot more to football than just that. Uh, and, you know, football is all about relationships. Um, and it's funny. Uh, <laughs> I've, uh, and I've got it on here. Uh, you know, you've got to know you play. Now, Coach Sorrells taught me that. And it's weird. I've said every coach needs to be a middle school football coach at some time in their life. It's weird that I chose to do that, do it at the end. Because when you're waiting on kids to get picked up two hours after a football game, you know, that's kind of hard. Uh, but, you know, you got to know all your players. You got to know the starters. You got to know the kids on the scout team. And uh, Ryan and Sean both said that this morning. It's funny. Coaches sometimes think a lot. Uh, and everybody's got an important role on the football team. Uh, my son is an equipment manager at the University of Clemson. Uh, and uh, I'm very proud of that. Uh, but Coach Sweeney stresses. The equipment manager's job is the most important job on the field, just like the quarterback's job is the most important job on the field. Everybody that uh, plays or is on the team has the most important job. So they're expected to execute it the best that they can. So that's a shout out to all equipment managers. Um, but one thing that I did uh, when I came down to the middle school uh, was we give a physical test. You don't hear a lot about that in middle school. Um, and their physical test consists of uh, we do a 30-second push-up test. We do a 60-second sit-up test. That replaces the squat and the uh, bench that we did at the high school. But then we do a side-to-side -side bag jump, a vertical jump, a standing broad jump a 40 time and an 800 time. Now, the reason those tests, I didn't know why we did those tests at high school. I had no idea, none. Coach 15 years, that's just what we did. We'd give kids tests. 
Yeah, well, when I talked with Coach Sorrells about why we did the test, he said, he said, it's for the parents. And I said, what? He said, when a parent comes to ask why my kid's not playing, he said, we need more than just say, I think. He said, when we turn and he's running a 5 3 40, you know, as a running back, that's why. You know, as a defensive lineman, uh, he only squatted uh, 315 15 times. You know, the coach said that gives us a firm leg to stand on. So, uh, you know, an another thing I got from Coach Sorrells, and I've said it earlier today uh, outside, is that every parent ought to believe their kid is the best player on the team. They ought to believe that. Every parent. But unless you get paid, your parent, your uh, opinion only matters at your house. <laughs> So, uh, and that, that say, I like when you're an assistant coach and you're young, you hear that, yeah, 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 yeah. When you get a little bit older, you understand, and uh, coach was exactly right. All right. And finally, uh, the biggest thing that I've learned in coaching uh, in the past 30 years is that coaches are your best friends. Period. You know, it's funny, and especially around here. Greenville and Elizabeth, and they knock heads. They play football. They play the same type of football. They play hard-nosed football. Uh, but I've said, Ryan Witten's one of the best friends I got. I mean, he's in the top three. He's in my quickie calls on my phone uh, because he means a lot to me. I can go to him with any problem, personal or professional, and he will give me honest feedback. Might not be what Todd Newberry wants to hear, but he's going to be honest and open with me. And the same thing. Um, but, uh, you know, we're all going to have enemies. Coaches are going to have enemies. There's going to be some coach that you're going to hang 50 points on that's going to hate you. But the best thing you can do professionally is try to give him a little bit of extra love. Make him make him understand you didn't do that first. Because sometimes coaches take things personal, take their professional life and bring it into the personal life. Um, so uh, from elementary school to middle school to high school, uh, the college, and therefore those coaches have had impacts on my life. Coach of mine named Frank Daughtery. Coach Daughtery coaches at Richlands High School in Virginia. He's their athletic director now and the wrestling coach. Uh, coach was my offensive line coach at Grundy. He's just got Snapchat. <laughs> so we send a Snapchat every day. And sometimes with coach, you don't know what you're going to get. Because sometimes older guys on Snapchat, which I'm considered an old guy on <laughs> Snapchat, uh, <laughs> it's I look forward to him. Like he sent me one this morning. They're getting ready to go to their wrestling championships. They were at a church in Cedar Bluff, Virginia, wrestling, but warming up before they get ready to go. So, um, but like I said, uh, you know, we're all got to be friends when we compete against each other. We can dislike each other for 48 minutes, 36 minutes, long playing against each other. But when that game's over, We've got to be each other's best friends. For you know, the resources that each of us have um, is unreal. You know, I've said that uh, Sean Witten out there, he and I were just talking about offenses, uh, about what works for us, what doesn't work for us. Uh, and that just doesn't happen everywhere. That just doesn't happen everywhere. So uh, finally, if you have any questions for me, I forgot to leave this one out. Uh, I'm going to give you my personal phone number. It's area code 423-620-0840. Uh, if you need to email me, uh, you can go to Greenville Middle School, look up a guy that's given the rock eyebrow. Uh, that's me. <laughs> uh, yeah, sometimes administrators don't like those silly pictures. The kids love it. Uh, but uh, uh, my, uh, 
My uh, email address is newberryt at gcschools.net. You all want to talk football, philosophy, uh, how to help kids, uh, let me know. Uh, it's been a big honor to be here. I hate I got to be last because all my time. But uh, I want to thank the Wittens for inviting me. That's pretty big. means a lot. So thank you all. Good job. Thank you to everybody for being here today. Um, please remember to take the survey that's in the chat box, or if y'all are here with us, the last page of your packet, you'll fill that out for us. Um, I will be emailing all of these slides and presentations to you all uh, within the next week or so. And um, we're just super grateful that you're here with us today and hope you have a great rest of your Saturday. Thank you.